NASA does uh, three things, uh, not in any particular order, but I'll put them in the priority of my own background. Uh, uh, the first thing we do is science, and uh, it's been a pretty exciting few decades for NASA and science. Uh, over the last few decades, uh, largely due to NASA space missions, I think we've revolutionized our understanding of physics. Uh, we now know we don't know hardly anything about the universe. That's called job security. And uh, uh, we, we hope to do the same with biology in the next decade or two. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those biological results because I know they're of great interest to you. Second is we do a lot of stuff to help life on Earth. And just two in particular, we uh, uh, have really built the understanding of climate change based on NASA work. Uh, and second, we're embarking on a program to revolutionize aviation. Sometimes we call it green aviation or environmentally responsible aviation to, uh, to develop a carbon neutral and eventually carbon free air transport system for the world. Uh, so these are significant focuses. But the majority of NASA's uh, budget is spent on human spaceflight. And uh, if you read the press, it's been pretty controversial. Uh, but uh, I'd like to state in no uncertain terms that the the, the objective, as I understand it, and I think most of the people working at NASA, is that our job is to begin settling the solar system. So what I'd like to do is, is spend a few minutes talking to you about some of the things we're doing and some speculative things about where we might go, uh, and then open for a few, a few questions. Now, uh, I, I sort of begin with this, uh, this chart. Uh, a few years ago on 1st of April, uh, this, uh, this appeared on the Google web website. Uh, and it's uh, about a, a, a joint venture between Google and Virgin Galactic called Virgil, uh, looking for volunteers to go settle Mars. Now, people soon realized this was 1st of April, was April Fool's Day, and it was a bit of a joke. However, I am absolutely convinced it's not a joke, and it certainly isn't a joke for the people that, uh, that uh, put this on there that run Google and Virgin. Uh, and this is what we're all about. So I want you to keep in mind that the uh, two very creative private sector companies uh, have this very much in the back of their mind. So, uh, uh, and, and by the way, I would never ignore anything that Google puts on April Fool's joke because they're very serious about making all of them real. So that, that, be scared, be very scared. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about settling the solar system. and. Uh, uh, I'd say based on our current understanding, the most likely place for permanent human habitation is Mars, uh, although there are other places like the lunar poles, potentially asteroids, and other places in the solar system, which we'll briefly touch on. Uh, one of the interesting uh, things about Mars, and I'll talk a little bit about this, is there is some thought and even some very tenuous evidence that uh, there may be life there already. Uh, but the particularly interesting part of Mars is what we can't see below the surface. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to suggest a, uh, a, an approach uh, that, uh, that to give you the upfront is that uh, uh, one of the keys to settling Mars or any place else is in situ resource utilization. I maintain that biological technologies, some of the things that you've been studying or working on, are key to uh, settling the solar system. <coughs> uh, I think, and I think the president thinks, which is more important than what I think, uh, that we ought to do this via stepping stones via asteroids. Uh, and uh, what the president doesn't think, and I have to be very careful because my boss got in trouble a few weeks ago by implying that the president thought something that he now says he didn't, uh, that the way to do this is to send colonists one way. And uh, uh, that's not my idea. I will tell you that both Larry Page and Sergey Brin have said that's the way to do it. And, and far be it for me to disagree with my neighbors who've made a lot more money than I have. This is Mars. Uh, the, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about the planet, but uh, uh, it's big, but smaller than Earth. Uh, and our initial understanding of it was, uh, uh, based on early space probes, was a pretty dead world. We got pictures back like this that, that looked pretty desolate. Uh, uh, although I went to graduate school in Arizona and it looks like Tucson, uh, so maybe not that desolate. Uh, right over the hill over there is the bar where we, <laughs> forget about that. 
that's a story for the bar. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, despite the desolation, uh, Mars is beginning to be increasingly interesting as a habitat for life. Uh, over the last few years, we understand that Mars is very rich in volatiles, uh, water and carbon compounds uh, that are the necessary building blocks for life. In fact, you can see at the poles, this is inside a crater here, this is actually a small glacier, uh, which we've confirmed is uh, ice. Uh, at the northern latitudes, uh, here's one of the Phoenix lander uh, with a claw went through the top few centimeters of uh, Martian regolith and discovered that right beneath the surface is ice. Uh, in fact, we now believe that much of Mars, even at the equatorial regions, uh, has ice not very far below the surface. Uh, there's a good reason to believe that Mars has retained most of the water it had. It, and we believe at one time, billions of years ago, it might have had oceans. Uh, but those are now uh, within the, fir the top few uh, kilometers or tens of kilometers below the surface. So very interesting. So keep, keep that in mind. Uh, uh, and I mentioned the, the, the uh, uh, regions below the surface, and, and I put Mars underground on here for a double reason. See, Chris McKay is here. I'll be talking to you soon. Uh, I first met Chris when he sneaked into my office at some Pentagon office or White House where I worked a long time ago, and he had a pin underneath his collar that said Mars underground uh, and was forming a group of people that, that, that really do understand the importance of, of this planet. But I think the underground uh, under the surface areas of Mars are the, are the real secret. Uh, we now believe there are volcanic hot spots that remain, although there's no molten core in Mars. Uh, we see evidence from magnetic fields and other, other evidence that there are ongoing uh, thermal processes below the surface. This means that there's chances for large quantities of liquid water and aquifers where there's flow. Uh, including energy flow, which again is a, is a prerequisite for, for life. So very interesting uh, set of regions. Now, uh, recently uh, there have been detected variable methane uh, that varies with the seasons uh, that are associated with some of these areas that we believe that, uh, uh, that, that have large aquifers under the surface. Uh, now methane can be produced by many different processes, but one of those, and one of the ones that's, that's uh, seen on Earth a lot, is uh, our life processes. So this is a piece of tantalizing evidence of, uh, of Martian uh, activity that could indicate that, that not only Mars is where life could have originated at one point, but its uh, location where it might still harbor life now. Uh, one of the other interesting things about Mars is that uh, uh, it may well be that Mars was the original abode of life in the solar system, uh, as the planet uh, might have evolved earlier than the Earth, uh, and that life on Earth came from Mars, a theory called panspermia. Uh, through impacts of asteroids, uh, we, we see a number of, of uh, pieces of asteroid on Earth that come from Mars. In fact, I'll, I'll mention it a little later, but one of them a few years ago, uh, uh, based on some White House staffer sleeping with a prostitute leaked that the president was going to talk about life on Mars. Uh, very much an American story. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the question of, of, of ancient or current life on Mars is, is very much an open issue. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Mars and asteroids, because uh, it now appears that, that the near-Earth asteroids are, uh, are a stepping stone to, to, to getting to Mars. Uh, this is a map a few years ago of, uh, uh, of known asteroids. And this is probably only a percent or so of the ones that are really there. Uh, initially, uh, you know, when, I, when I went to school in the 18th century, uh, we only knew about a handful of asteroids that came inside the orbit of Mars. Now we have several thousand of them. Uh, and so it's beginning to look like a shooting gallery. Uh, it's a different topic, but... Uh, uh, Understanding the, uh, the impacts of asteroids on Earth is very important, uh, and there's an important topic called planetary defense, which is a, a whole separate subject. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, there are thousands of these things that are rather easily accessible. Uh, asteroids have uh, uh, very diverse 
uh, characters and composition. Uh, uh, this is a, a close-up taken from the Hayabusa mission. This is asteroid Itikawa. Uh, and this is uh, the smallest one that we have visited up close. Uh, although there have been small ones that visited the Earth up close, like the one that killed the dinosaurs some 65 million years ago. Uh, but th this is uh, about half a kilometer. Uh, the, uh, uh, just by comparison, the International Space Station and, uh, and uh, a, a capsule which NASA may or may not build. Uh, but uh, but this, this is a probably a rather typical object of the type that uh, that uh, is between the Earth and, and, uh, and Mars. Now, there have been a number of, uh, of missions to, to asteroids. Most of these are in the main belt. Uh, these are much larger just by, uh, by comparison. Uh, I don't even think Itakawa, oh, here it is. <laughs> this little tiny dot here is Itakawa. Uh, and these are more typical asteroids in the main belt we know about. And this is actually not an asteroid, but a comet. Uh, and I put these on here because the, the composition of these from what we can tell, and we can tell a lot about them because fragments of them fall to the Earth as meteorites, uh, have a huge range of compositions from, in some cases they are virtually pure metal, to other cases where they are uh, uh, mostly ices and, and other volatiles. Uh, and again, Halley's Comet is an example of the, of the second category, and a whole range in between. Uh, and the reason this is interesting is because, again, the, the ones that have rich in volatiles are potentially uh, abodes for, for life. Now, uh, until a few months ago, uh, NASA was busy building these two rockets. Uh, this one was going to replace the shuttle, and this one was going to replace the, the old Saturn V. Uh, however, when we got uh, busy working on those, we found that duplicating Apollo uh, was unaffordable. Uh, in fact, it was so unaffordable that we, we would never get there. So the, the president has proposed to Congress that we, uh, is a question back there? Saturn V was the moon rocket that we used to go to uh, uh, the Apollo program to go to the moon. And uh, you know, there's a, just a kind of brief digression is that that at the end of uh, the Apollo program in the mid-70s, uh, NASA was faced with shutdown, basically. So we pursued a reusable rocket, uh, the space shuttle, which through various engineering changes didn't get to be very reusable. Uh, the idea was going to be very cheap and get us to space. Uh, then we could go on with exploring and settling the solar system. However, uh, it turned out not to be very cheap. So the, the next attempt was to go back to Apollo, but separate, in this case, the crew was on the top. We decided to put the crew on a dedicated launch vehicle and then put the cargo on a heavy lift launch vehicle. Uh, th this program appears to be underfunded by about a factor of 50% to a factor of two. Uh, we had a commission that President Obama commissioned about uh, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, run by former uh, uh, Lockheed Martin CEO Norm Augustine, and they concluded that this is unaffordable. Uh, and I'll show you what we've what we have replaced it with, and that's what the controversy is. Congress doesn't like this because Congress uh, is interested in jobs, and there's a lot of jobs tied up. Some 50,000 people work in these programs, so uh, you're, see you're seeing a huge fight if you look in the press uh, about NASA and what our budget is. In fact. Congress is about to issue us a directive to continue these stupid programs, and I'll say that officially, uh, because they aren't going to get us anywhere, but uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, at any rate, uh, we looked at could we use these new programs, and this we did about two years ago, uh, to go to asteroids, and we, we did a number of, of, uh, of uh, uh, models, and it looked, actually, it's easier to go to an asteroid than go to the lunar surface. The reason is, is the the moon has fairly substantial gravity. It's about one-sixth Earth gravity. So if you go to the moon, you've got to land on the moon and take off again. Uh, but asteroids are much smaller, have essentially no gravity. Uh, so once you leave the Earth's gravity field, which you essentially are when you go to the moon, uh, it takes less delta V uh, energy, uh, if you will, to get to, to an asteroid than get to the moon. Uh, we, we developed a number of uh, human missions. 
Uh, this was an example of one that uh, uh, could be done uh, uh, in 2025, uh, was about a uh, five-month round-trip mission. So these began to have quite a lot of appeal. Uh, what uh, the Obama administration has said is that uh, if we're going to go to a lot of places in the solar system, rather than build a system as we were that was really aimed at going back to the moon, why not build something that uh, uh, could go to lots of places in the solar system? And th this is, we sort of refer to it as an exploration metro map. So if you're going to build systems, uh, build ones that enable you to go to, to lots of different points, asteroids, moons of Mars, Mars, outer planets, uh, and the moon, uh, and other locations in space that are interesting for places to put scientific instruments. Uh, two very interesting ones are the, the equilibrium points between the Earth and the moon, and also the equilibrium points between the Earth and the sun, which make ideal locations to place uh, scientific instruments. Uh, so there were a couple things that we are now proposing to do, and I just want to briefly cover them. But uh, uh, in the next few years, we want to turn access uh, from low Earth orbit or to low Earth orbit over to the private sector. Uh, companies like SpaceX, Elon Musk company, and, and uh, Orbital Sciences and others are demonstrating that they can commercially take people to low Earth orbit. Uh, so we want to do various things on the station uh, and begin to develop technologies. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these technologies. Uh, then uh, uh, later on in the decade, begin to build uh, missions that enable us to get in the vicinity of the, of the, the moon, fly by the, uh, fly by the moon. Uh, the key thing here is to build a f the first true spaceship. Today, when we go someplace, we uh, launch a, a big stack off the Earth uh, that has a little bit of propulsion on it, and you basically have to throw everything in one push. Uh, a true spaceship would have an onboard propulsion system that can continually uh, uh, have a continuous propulsion system, and that's the technology that we're beginning to work on if Congress gives us the money. But the next part of this is uh, in the middle of the, of the 2020s that we would go to near-Earth orbit uh, or to, to a, a near-Earth asteroid. We'd have our first true human spaceship. We'd also go to these equilibrium points. Uh, and we'd be able to have astronauts get out at the, uh, the uh, uh, near-Earth uh, objects, and then 2026 plus go to Mars and the lunar surface. Uh, so this is a, the, the new program as NASA has defined it. Uh, again, uh, I want to point out the key to it is to build a true spaceship, probably uh, solar electric power uh, and uh, uh, electric propulsion. These are technologies that, if you watch sci-fi movies, so-called ion drives. Uh, but uh, the technology has is, 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 uh, uh, been advanced quite considerably. Uh, so again, we have sort of a stepping stone strategy. I won't go into a lot of these details. But uh, the idea is to, is to progressively go in the vicinity of the moon, then go to deep space, go to asteroids, uh, and then the moons of Mars. And I'll say a little bit more about the moons of Mars before we go to the Martian surface. Uh, the, uh, uh, and again, this is sort of a notional time scale when we might get to these places. Uh, again, it depends on funding and technological process. But the, uh, uh, in the next few years, we would do precursor robotic missions. We would start to develop solar electric propulsion until we get to the point where we actually built a true spaceship. Uh, the first demonstration of this uh, is proposed to happen in about two or three years. Uh, it's a high-power solar electric propulsion demonstration. Uh, I'm really pleased that at least preliminarily this center has been asked to lead this program. It's nominally a half billion to billion dollar effort. Uh, it also involves the Department of Defense, uh, who has developed a lot of the basic technology. So a very interesting uh, program that, that, that's moving forward. Uh, but the idea is that this technology enables us to get not only human missions, in the inner solar system, but also to do a lot more uh, robotic explorations in the outer solar system using electric propulsion, where you can uh, you, you get for the same amount of fuel uh, 10 to 100 times more efficient uh, propulsion. Although the 
the, uh, the, the, the kick you get from it is a lot lower, uh, the efficiency is much higher. Uh, human missions uh, uh, would, to, to Mars would be something like 90 to 270 days. Human missions to, uh, to asteroids are, uh, are, are somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat faster. And we could even go to the main belt asteroids uh, here in the next, uh, next 30 years or so. Now, let me say a little bit more about asteroids because I, I think they're a, you know, a, a very exciting very exciting set of targets. Uh, they are, in some sense, the leftover building blocks of the solar system. The, uh, our current understanding of planetary formation is that, that the early solar nebula in the first few hundred years of the sun's lifetime uh, began to coalesce into these small uh, agglomerations that were probably tens to hundreds of kilometers across. Over time, uh, the, these uh, collided with each other and, and began to coalesce into the larger planets. Uh, but, but there's still a lot of these building blocks left over. Of course, a lot of them themselves have, have uh, undergone collisions and, and uh, fragmentation. So understanding asteroids is a very interesting scientific tool. A second, uh, and I think this is really important, is that, that as I mentioned, some of these things have uh, high metal content, but more importantly, some of them have high, high volatile content, uh, which is the key to, to uh, expanding or extending life in the solar system. Finally, uh, and again, this is a topic I'm not going to get into, but asteroids do hit the planet. Uh, the last major one we knew about was in 1908, a, uh, probably a, more of a comet than an asteroid, although the main difference is how much volatiles they have. Uh, hit uh, over Siberia in a place called Tunguska. Uh, it detonated with a force of several megatons uh, and destroyed a forest about 50 kilometers across. Uh, probably didn't kill anybody because it was a pretty isolated location, but because of various political things going on in, the, in Russia at the time, nobody got into there until the, about 20 years later uh, and, and began to collect, uh, collect data. Now, I got, I have to, a little digression, I got in trouble about five or four years ago. I was at a planetary defense conference where people were trying to figure out how to defend against these. And a Washington Post reporter came up and asked me about a recent study that NASA did about planetary defense. And uh, the, uh, uh, you know, I was telling about Tunguska, and uh, he said, well, could you put that in the terms people understand? I said, well, if it had gone off over, Washington, D.C., it would have destroyed everything inside the Beltway. And uh, the, uh, uh, now I would have thought that was a good thing, but uh, uh, the, uh, obviously the politicians in Washington didn't, so I was roundly consoled about that particular faux pas. Uh, but at any rate, the, uh, uh, these asteroids are very interesting. Uh, another set of objects which uh, uh, are extremely interesting, are the moons of Mars. Mars has two small moons, Phobos and Deimos. Uh, there is some belief that these are captured asteroids, uh, that uh, over time Mars captured these two small asteroids. Uh, we, we don't know for sure the composition of them, but uh, uh, these are about uh, 20, the larger ones about 20 kilometers across, but it appears to be that they are ideal locations from which to uh, study the Martian surface, and I'll talk a little bit about this in detail, but they also may uh, contain volatiles, so a number of missions that could go to, uh, to uh, Phobos and Diemos to look at uh, what the composition is and the suitability for human exploration bases are, are very much in our thinking. The, uh, uh, what uh, uh, has been preliminarily planned out are a series of, uh, of small and medium-sized robotic missions to asteroids and uh, and uh, uh, the moons of Mars, these are called X-Scouts, uh, but uh, we're looking at uh, uh, in the next, uh, next five years, two or three of these, depending again if Congress funds them. Uh, we're also developing technology for small satellites and programs called the uh, Franklin Edison. Uh, these programs are being managed uh, here at NASA Ames. There are also some larger precursor missions that uh, we and probably the Jet Propulsion Laboratory will be involved with. But these are designed to go 
and, uh, and visit these asteroids uh, to, uh, to begin to understand the composition, the uh, opportunities, the, the hazards, and so forth before, before we send people there. Uh, one of the things we already understand is there's no typical asteroids from, uh, from things that have gone to date. This is the surface of, uh, of uh, Itakawa from the uh, Japanese Hayabusa probe. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, this kind of rubble pile look. Uh, this is the closest up image we've ever had, but some of the other asteroids look to be very smooth. So, again, there's a lot of, a lot of differences. Uh, resource identification from spectroscopy is, is something that, that needs to be done as well. The, uh, now, another mission which, which I'm pretty excited about that was done here, uh, about a year ago, we launched a, uh, uh, two satellites to the moon. One was called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is still in orbit collecting high resolution mapping data to the moon. Uh, it cost about half a billion dollars, but this was one that was built here called LCROSS, Lunar Crater Observing and Sensing Satellite. Uh, and its purpose was to basically take the upper stage of the uh, rocket that launched it and uh, impact the moon uh, in order to throw up a number of material in the lunar polar craters, which are places that, that we thought might contain water and other volatiles. Uh, now, I put bombing the moon on here. Uh, and I got in a lot of trouble for this. I mean, I thought it was kind of cool because uh, uh, for those of you that know my background, I was an Air Force general, and uh, Air Forces do bombing. And so when we had the final readiness review at Johnson Space Center, or at Kennedy Space Center, I, uh, uh, when they went around the table, and this was, this was the first time I was allowed to sit at the adult table, uh, they would ask if uh, you know, launch services go, you know, they, Goddard Space Flight Center go, and they got around and said Ames Research Center, and I said Ames is go for the first precision bombing run on the moon. And uh, everybody thought that was funny, so I made a real big mistake, I put it on Twitter. Uh, various people read the Twitter and decided that this was some secret U.S. CIA plot to to bomb aliens that, that people thought were in the <laughs> poles of the moon and start an interstellar war. So uh, I was once again counseled by the leadership and by my scientists that, like, could you kind of shut up? <laughs> but, but anyhow, I thought it was pretty cool still. Uh, we, we hit within 100 meters, so uh, that's better precision bombing than, than the Air Force ever did before so, uh, from that distance. So, uh, so it, it was a pretty neat mission. But, uh, we are looking at, uh, at ways to use and adapt this technology. The whole mission cost 78 million U.S. dollars, so it was a, it was a pretty, good, uh, pretty good mission. And uh, so we are looking at taking these technologies that we used for that, putting them together in, in more uh, low-cost missions that we could then send to, uh, uh, to near-Earth asteroids, both to orbit and to impact and to sample, uh, and then eventually here in the middle of the decade uh, to go to uh, 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 do more uh, in situ sampling, and then finally to, uh, uh, to do something with, uh, with Phobos. Now, there's one other piece to this exploration program, uh, 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 well, and then eventually go to the Martian surface. Uh, with technology understood. And I want to talk a little bit about the Martian surface in a minute. Uh, but there's one other piece I want to talk about, which is commercialization. And uh, uh, it has been the U.S. government's experience that if you can turn something over to the private sector, you can, cha you can save at least a factor of two. Uh, and one reason that we can afford this ambitious human exploration program is that if we can save money getting to low Earth orbit, uh, and this is the essence of the arguments you'll hear uh, within and outside NASA. Uh, if uh, your paycheck comes from NASA to build a rocket, you think that this is evil. Uh, if, you're, if you're more interested in actual exploration and things we do in space, this is good. Uh, this is uh, the Falcon 9 launch, launched in early June. Uh, the first new booster developed in the United States in a long time and uh, developed completely with private, uh, uh, private money. And uh, it promises to be able to supply both uh, equip equipment and uh, human transportation to low Earth orbit. Uh, 
there are other companies that are close behind uh, orbital sciences, but, but I want to emphasize that if we are to do this ambitious exploration program, this is critical. We must be able to, to, uh, to buy this stuff, just buy tickets rather than, than pay for all the, the infrastructure. Uh, they built this rocket for less money than it cost us to build the, the gantry that we would launch the Ares-1. So uh, a very significant uh, activity. And as you talk about the private sector doing a lot of things, I think this is, this is, a, this is a great example. Now, I want to turn to another topic here, which is uh, uh, life and uh, uh, how we spread life elsewhere. And part of that is understanding how life works here and being able to modify it. Uh, this is uh, 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 cyanobacteria. Uh, a lot of you have biological backgrounds. You know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but uh, this is arguably the, the organism that, that created the possibilities for life on Earth. It's, it's clearly one of the oldest organisms. Uh, it's uh, perhaps the first one that was able to do photosynthesis. Uh, and a byproduct of, of billions of years of its activity in the, in the oceans uh, was to create an oxygen atmosphere. So very exciting uh, possibility. And I would maintain that cyanobacteria or something like it is going to have to be grown in space if we intend to, uh, uh, intend to settle other worlds. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned ice and other organics. Uh, there's been a lot of work recently uh, that, uh, that the materials needed to support things like cyanobacteria uh, exist on, uh, uh, on asteroids. Uh, there are some very simple designs that don't weigh very much where you could take cyanobacteria and grow it in, in uh, using in situ resources. Uh, this is a program that we have just started here at NASA Ames to figure out how to uh, how to grow things like cyanobacteria uh, on asteroids using asteroid material to produce oxygen uh, and other products that, uh, that you'd need for, for human life there. Uh, I know that some of you are in the, uh, in the, in the team project that's going to be looking at this, so uh, we're very looking forward to uh, some of your opinions on this. Uh, of course, a lot of you know this man. Uh, I'm very excited about synthetic biology because I think one of its most important applications is to adapt life so that it can live in very hostile environments that, that we see in space and produce useful products. Uh, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to the future progress, understanding that, that we have just begun here. I mean, uh, uh, we really don't know a lot about uh, uh, what DNA is actually telling us and, and how things are, are then translated into uh, the working engineering. Uh, and, and of course, the idea that, that we're actually able to synthesize uh, and really write programming for a, for a new cell is uh, in its infancy. So, uh, but again, I'm very excited about that. Uh, for NASA, uh, I see a number of applications for this. And these are all as important, if not more important, than the rockets that get us there is uh, biological in situ uh, resource utilization, uh, low mass missions from the Earth. Uh, if we were to try to create a settlement on the Moon or Mars today using technology, we know we'd have to send thousands of tons of mining equipment that breaks down and has high tech capabilities. If we do this right, all we need to do is send a few vials of properly engineered bacteria uh, that can extract uh, uh, critical resources. Uh, a lot of discussion in, in some of the communities you've talked to about self-replicating robots. Uh, well, life is a self-replicating robot, and our ability to harness this is very important. What you'd like to do is, is, is tailor life that could uh, go to some place like Mars and the Martian surface to, uh, to create useful products. Uh, and uh, one can imagine engineering it to, to have a self-building habitat. Now, this begins to border on science fiction, but uh, that's what Singularity University is all about. Uh, and then eventually, if you were to send a settlement to places like Mars, uh, that uh, it could do in, in, in situ uh, uh, gene development now. Again, I, I sort of like this because uh, you, know, you can build some pretty interesting things that are related to habitats, uh, starting with a pretty small uh, coating here. So. Uh, uh, we just need to figure out how to harness this. Uh, maybe easier said than done. Now, 
we're also doing uh, robotic life uh, science experiments. This is Pharmasat 1. Uh, we're able to launch for a few million dollars or less, eventually a few hundred thousand dollars, very small biological uh, uh, processing payloads into orbit. Uh, uh, this was one that tested the uh, uh, virulence of uh, uh, various bacteria uh, in low Earth orbit and zero G environments. It was a very successful uh, experiment and uh, uh, pretty excited about it. And I think that we're eventually going to be able to, to bring these back from space uh, very cheaply. Uh, I want to also emphasize, I mean, th th this is a, a piece of a meteor that we have, uh, we have here uh, that fell about 10 years ago from the Tagish Lake meteor. It is actually about 30 percent volatiles and, and carbon compounds, so it, it kind of looks like a piece of coal and has a chemistry that's not a lot different than that. So uh, we're, we are beginning experiments uh, with some of our colleagues in Canada. Can you grow things like cyanobacteria on these, uh, on these materials? Uh, I, I mentioned uh, Elcross, uh, uh, the uh, uh, and Phobos and Deimos. These are very interesting targets. Uh, this is sort of to the scale of the of, of the two moons of Mars. Uh, their orbits, uh, they're very close to Mars. Uh, uh, Phobos is only six thousand kilometers from the surface. It makes a, a very good space station for uh, telerobotic operation on the surface of Mars. Uh, you can send people there that they wouldn't have to go to the surface of Mars, with Mars having one-third Earth gravity. Uh, it becomes very difficult to get down there and off without very expensive systems, uh, but you could land telerobotic systems that could be operated with only a few tenths of a second uh, time delay. Uh, now, the, uh, it turns out that, that uh, going to Phobos uh, via asteroids is very much in our, uh, our report. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Augustine uh, report said that, uh, that we ought to go to asteroids, that's one of their top, and eventually the moons of Mars. Uh, and maybe more importantly, uh, uh, somebody else that we work for uh, said that we should send humans to orbit Mars. Uh, this is sort of the Obama-Kennedy statement. And uh, uh, so I think we've got some pretty good direction to go forward with, with some of these programs to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Phobos. Just again to show you the size of this uh, this object, it's uh, uh, kind of equivalent to the to the Bay Area uh, in terms of its uh, of its area. So it's uh, it, it, it's not a terribly big object, but it's a very interesting one. Now, there's another reason to go to Phobos. Uh, I mentioned that uh, in the 90s, uh, this is a piece of Mars, and. Uh, uh, over the last few hundred millions of years. Asteroids have hit Mars, knocked pieces off. They travel in space for millions of years. And some of them eventually fall to, to Earth. Uh, in Antarctica, uh, we're able to collect these because the only rocks that are found on the, on the ice in some locations are things that fell from the sky. Uh, so this was a Martian meteorite. We know that because of the chemical composition and trapped atmosphere matches the Martian atmosphere. Uh, this were some structures that were seen, fossilized structures in the rock. Uh, they were originally identified as, as, the, as evidence of some sort of fossilized uh, bacteria. Uh, they're much smaller than any bacteria on the Earth, uh, so there's a lot of argument on whether these are real or not. However, it is tantalizing evidence. Now, uh, I put this picture up for those of you familiar with the War of the Worlds that will remember that the Martians that came to the Earth uh, were defeated by Earth microorganisms. Uh, and. Uh, the possibility that there's extant life on Mars is a very interesting one, but uh, it's also a scary one. And I'm told if, if you happen to be a, a conservative, that you're deathly afraid of uh, Mars life killing us, and if you're a liberal, you're afraid of our life killing it. Uh, but either way, uh, uh, whenever we mix life from ra radically different areas, uh, usually one kills the other one. So. Before we go to the Martian surface with people, we're probably going to want to understand, is there anything there, and is it, is it, is it dangerous? So uh, being able to send people to Phobos where they can then drill uh, or do other things that they can do telerobotically, which is a lot simpler than doing an autonomous robot with our current levels of technology, is, is a very interesting possibility. 
So I would uh, maintain that, that human settlement of the, of the solar system is, is we will look at places where we find volatiles. Uh, the lunar polar craters is one area. Uh, meteors are another, and maybe Phobos. Uh, and then eventually Mars is sort of our path. Uh, and I think the key technology will be life sciences, uh, particularly synthetic biology. Uh, I want to say a few words here before closing about uh, uh, more speculative stuff. And uh, uh, the expert on that is Chris McKay, so you can ask him the details. But there is certainly the possibility at some point in the distant future that, that we could turn Mars into a terrestrial-like environment. Uh, you can, one can argue about the ethics over that. but. Uh, Again, that, that the resources are there. It appears that the water on the Martian uh, or on Mars is sufficient to, to actually, you know, if you did it right, to recreate oceans. Uh, so the possibility of turning from red Mars to a green Mars is, is very much uh, uh, an interesting one. Uh, Chris also has talked a little bit about uh, uh, life at another location. Uh, the uh, uh, the large moon of Saturn, Titan, is, uh, uh, has a lot of very interesting processes that involve liquid. Uh, it has a, uh, a fairly thick atmosphere, but it has uh, hydrocarbon rain and hydrocarbon lakes. Uh, and it has processes that, uh, that could form some sort of bizarre life uh, and that uh, uh, it, it may itself be a, a, a potential location for life. And this was a paper that, uh, that uh, Chris and some of his colleagues have, uh, have written about that there could be uh, methane-based life uh, on, on Mars that would operate under certain different chemical processes, but all of the processes uh, are things we understand about the energy is there and so forth. Uh, Chris pointed out that, that there is very tenuous evidence that some of these uh, uh, non-uniformities and non-equilibrium conditions could indicate some sort of weird life on, on Titan. So uh, that's another location in the solar system that, that we could look for for, for life. Uh, other places uh, uh, are that have water uh, in addition to Mars and fluids in addition to Titan. Europa appears to have underneath the ice uh, very thick oceans. Uh, Enceladus uh, clearly has ice processes that we can see uh, geysers and other, other, other stuff. Now, a little further out, uh, and this is why I'm not going to leave this with you because this is a very preliminary result, Kepler is a mission that we launched last year. Uh, it's the first mission capable of finding Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of other stars. Uh, this is a very preliminary set of, of results. What we do is we look for the eclipse of a planet in front of the star, and it, if the if you have a stellar system that's edge on to where we're looking and the planet goes in front of the star, you'll see a very small dip in the light. It's only a few parts per million. Uh, we now have about uh, six months worth of data. But from that data already, this is the habitable zone for Earth-type life. And you see we have a number of candidate planets. Now, I, want, I say candidate because uh, there are a lot of other processes that can mimic planets. We find typically half of these things are not are not, uh, not really planets, but of the 20 or so here, you see that uh, most of them are fairly large. They're giant planets. Uh, but there are a couple things here that are beginning to get. This is the size of the Earth. So uh, we think within the next six months or so, we should have a confirmed Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. But we do have these giant planets, which, uh, which I find kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this picture. Uh, but those of you that saw the movie Avatar, uh, you know, the, this is one of the advertising pictures and uh, with a, a starship from Earth. But uh, uh, the giant planet uh, that was in the habitable zone was uh, called uh, Polyphemus and then Pandora's moon. We do believe that we can detect Earth-sized moons around some of these giant planets as we watch several of these eclipses of these stars. So uh, it is entirely possible in the next... Uh, uh, next few decades, that, that, or next few uh, years, we'll find these kind of things. Now, I want to close with a, a, a statement about private settlement. Uh, and this is the way I think we will settle other worlds. Uh, there's a long history in North America of this. Uh, the, the, the first uh, 
permanent European settlement in, in North America began as a private settlement in 1620. For those of you that know your American history, this is the Mayflower. Uh, it actually didn't go very well, but uh, that's a point. Uh, there have been a lot of serious proposals about sending humans one way to Mars to settle. Uh, I think it's a serious issue. Uh, there does exist on Mars caves, and this is uh, some data from some of the Mars orbiters, that could be potentially sealed. Uh, this particular one is probably not very suitable. It's about a, you know, it's up high on a mountain, but it's about a hundred meter diameter. But this does indicate substantial underground uh, features on Mars, so you could potentially seal these and, and live in them and uh, maintain uh, more Earth-like uh, atmospheric conditions. Uh, of course, uh, you know, NASA periodically is toyed with commercializing things. This was a few years ago when. People were trying to, to sell space on the space station. Didn't go very well. But I do mention that the true private sector, both in suborbital and orbital, is, is making really good progress. Uh, so kind of in conclusion, the, uh, I think we'll soon have the ability to, to visit Mars and other places in the, in the solar system on a routine basis. Uh, I think settlement is the only rational basis for, uh, for human space exploration. Uh, I think the path to Mars, uh, which is current choice or the best place for permanent human settlement, is via near-Earth asteroids and, uh, and its moon Phobos. I think engineered biotechnology is going to be the key to that uh, and private one-way settlement missions. Uh, my current estimate is between five and ten billion U.S. dollars is probably what it would take to, to send a private mission to one-way mission to Mars, and I think that's within the wherewithal of, of, of people that that are around and interested in this. Well, let me stop there. I think I have time for one or two quick questions. So, yeah. Uh, I just kind of want to, I don't know much about the way that you like send stuff to other planets, but given that we're always at different positions in the universe, it's not just a line, so how, how often or how many years is like, the window actually closed with this sense of the to 10 years delay? Well, the, the question is how often do we have a window to get to another planet? And that's the uh, celestial mechanics and, uh, and orbital mechanics is a, is, a, is a key part of space exploration. Uh, a lot of it depends on what you use for propulsion. Uh, today we kick something off the, the planet and it, uh, it takes, uh, you know, it gets almost all of its thrust in the first, you know, few tens of minutes. Uh, and we, we have minimum energy trajectories. Uh, it only takes a few days to get to the moon, and we can get to the moon almost any time. Uh, these asteroids that are near the Earth uh, typically uh, come near the Earth every year or two, so they're easy to get to every year or two. Mars is in a position that we have a minimum energy access to it about every two years. Uh, however, the technology we're developing, which would be a continuous solar electric thrust, would, would make it possible to go just about any time. The travel time with current technology to Mars is months uh, the, uh, uh, to about a year. So again, depending on the technology you use, further out in the solar system takes longer. It takes like five or ten years to get to Jupiter and Saturn uh, with the energy we, energetics we've got. We did send a probe to the outermost former planet, Pluto, and I think, think that's taking about ten year, twelve years to get there. That's the fastest object. that humans ever, uh, ever did, and it's, it's using some unique, you know, orbital mechanics, so you swing by other planets to add energy. But uh, uh, navigating around the solar system is sort of like uh, uh, in the 15th century and 16th century, navigating on ships. It takes about the same amount of time, and you've got to watch the season of the year as, uh, you know, when things are available, and, and uh, so... Uh, uh, we're just at the beginning, but it's not, it's not terribly difficult. It doesn't take, you know, centuries to get these places. Yeah. Hi. Um, how do you think we're doing in transferring the technologies that we're developing for space to Earth-based applications, and what's your estimate on the potential of this transfer? Are we doing well enough, or is there a backlog of uh, innovations that we are using in space, like International Space Station, both systems, uh, that we can bring back on Earth and affect lives of people? Well, Na NASA is developing a lot of technology, but not as much as it used to be. In fact, in the last 
four or five years, we largely terminated our technology developments. The, the hope is to start them again. Uh, it's probably not the case that NASA has a terribly large amount of technology that other folks don't. Uh, it's our experience recently that the private sector actually uh, has, has much better technology. Uh, and that, uh, you know, it's sort of, you know, there's an arrogant attitude in the United States that our technology is better than other people's. Uh, that's rubbish. Uh, we passed this law about 15 years ago called ITAR, International Trafficking and Arms Regulations, that said that all space things were sensitive, so it means we can't export U.S. technology. Uh, what that's resulted in is everybody else's technology being better than ours now. So what I'd like to do is get rid of it so I can use other people's technology. So I think that, that to do these things, a lot of the technology is there, but it, it isn't been developed by NASA. Uh, we do make a big effort to the technology we do develop there. At every center like this one, there's a technology transfer office. Uh, we have funding that, that is available to help people transfer it. So there is some substantial programs. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, you talked about um, how the, the SpaceX rocket costs less or the same as the launch tower of uh, NASA particular. Less to NASA. develop, yeah. Less to develop, right. Is, how much of that is due to NASA having already developed it? How much of that is due to the economics of the situation in the, in the job market, uh, not the job, sorry, the, the amount you have to pay engineers and so forth? Well, there's a, there's a lot of different reasons. I mean, uh, uh, the private sector can be very efficient, and you know they, uh, uh, if they need a uh, propulsion engineer, they go out and hire him for a week, and then, you know, as a consultant, and then he or she goes off and does something else. Uh, the government tends to keep, you know, a, a big standing army. In fact, NASA uh, is a. Uh, as I said, after Apollo became a jobs program, and in fact, if you'd like my rather sarcastic opinion on it, uh, I published in the early 90s a paper called On Self-Licking Ice Cream Cones. Uh, if you look it up on the net, you'll find it. And uh, but the, the point is, is that uh, uh, in order to stay in business, NASA has a huge number of people. And so uh, the way we do things is just with a lot of people and a lot of money. Uh, it's nice if you have it, uh, but we don't think we have it anymore. The, uh, now, what critics of, of people like Elon Musk would say is, well, the thing he'd build isn't safe, it hasn't been checked out, it's, you know, he was lucky, he, he stole a lot of the technology from the, from the government or from somebody else, and my point is, so what? You know, I mean, he was able to do this very affordably, uh, that the technology to get to low Earth orbit isn't terribly high-tech anymore, it's mostly involved with with good manufacturing. Uh, Elon is vertically integrated, so he doesn't, he has complete control of all the processes. So I, I think that it's, it demonstrates the efficiency of a privately operated uh, and uh, profit motivated organization. Uh, NASA isn't. And uh, uh, I think the efficiency is at least a factor of 10. Now, when you actually finally buy something, it may only be a factor of two or three, but that's a lot. That's the money we need to do what NASA does well, is actually do the, the, something's never been done before. Uh, in our case, I think it's building a true spaceship. Well, let me stop there, and thank you. Uh, hey, thanks, Pete. Uh,